All right. Well, it's 5.31 p.m. on June 8, 2021. This is the regular session meeting for the month of June for the Monroe County Council. Welcome, everybody. We are called to order. And as we always do, we'll do a roll call of all the council members present. So please have your microphones unmuted and state your name when I call the roll. Mr. Deckard. Here. Ms. Hawk. Here. Mr. Iverson. Here. Mr. McKim. Here. Ms. Munson. Here. Ms. Wilkes. Here. Terrific. Everyone is here and accounted for. So we'll move forward with our agenda. Next item on the agenda is our Pledge of Allegiance. So if we'll all stand, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance yes, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, God, and God, individual liberty, liberty, justice, and justice for all. For all. One of my favorite traditions of our regular session meetings. Thank you all. And up next will be uh, item number three, our public comment. Do we have any, and this is public comment for items not on the agenda. Do we have any members here from the public who would like to make comment on items not on our agenda? If so, please indicate uh, by using the raised hand feature in Zoom. I'm looking here at our attendees list. I do not see that there is any desire to make public comment for items not on the agenda. So going once, going twice. All right. We will now move on to adoption of our agenda for this evening. And do we have any council members who would like to make changes or updates, modifications, edits to our agenda. And this is the agenda <clears throat> that is posted on the Monroe County government website uh, currently. So if you need to see a copy of that or need to view it, want to know what we're working off of tonight, it's posted on the uh, Monroe County government website. Any takers on changes to our agenda this evening? I do have one uh, modification that I would like to make, and this is for, I'm not quite sure how to uh, phrase this. So this will be for, the, uh, for item 9B, and I would just ask, and this is our uh, uh, resolution approving tax abatement compliance findings. I would just ask that as a courtesy to our um, uh, the individual that will be presenting to us tonight that we, uh, wherever we're at on the agenda tonight at 6.30 p.m. that we stop and move to item 6B uh, to accommodate uh, that person's schedule. Would that, uh, would that be okay with everybody? Item 9B. 9B. Item 9B, yes. But at 6.30 p.m. we consider that yep. or as close to 6.30 p.m. as possible. Okay, so that's my motion. Second. Yeah, any discussion? Any yep. concerns? Any public comment? All right, we'll do a roll call vote, please, to amend the agenda. On the motion to amend the agenda, uh, Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Wilt? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Dickard? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Thank you. Okay, any further amendments or modifications to the agenda? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to item five, which is department updates. <clears throat> Do we have any departments uh, joining us tonight who would like to make an update? for the council. And I see Ms. Purdy, our uh, commissioner's administrator. Welcome. Thank yeah. you for joining us tonight. Yes, good evening. Um, I wanted to give just a few updates. And um, 
the first one I wanted to give was there's an, uh, um, another exciting um, meeting coming up on June 23rd at 530. It will be available through Zoom. And it's going to be that combined meeting of the Board of Commissioners and this body um, and the public. And at that time, you guys will hear from the Criminal Justice Review Consultants and um, be able to ask questions and um, hopefully engage our community in the information that we hopefully will be receiving on the 23rd. Uh, the other is item I have for you is specific to the use of the um, COVID CARES money that had been received by the county in 2020. And you guys appropriated it in, I believe, February of this year. Um, the only ones of significant use has been the emergency services housing. We have provided the townships with an additional $25,000. So a total of $50,000 has, has been expended from that particular line. And that leaves it with a balance of $250,000. Um, the contractual line also sees some activity. That's the one where we have paid Security Pro, um, medics, which is part of the testing site, I believe, and um, a grant manager. And we have expended $136,084.30 from that particular line. Balance remains of $113,915.70. Our supply line, which we have been going th through like crazy last year, um, is doing much, much better this year, back more in line with um, kind of our normal expenses for cleaning expenses. And because that's what generally this, this money is used for. So of the 250,000, we've actually only spent $11,168.40. We had encumbered $38,354.60 to cover the end of the year expenses, um, not paid out in 2020. So we actually have a balance of $238,831.60. Um, let's see here, the, yeah, nope, that's it. That's all I have for, um, um, my updates for the council at this point in time. Excellent. Very good. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that the date, uh, for the, uh, the criminal justice report meeting has been set and we're able to, you know, meet that, uh, June timeframe. Uh, that we had committed to. So uh, that's all wonderful and hope to see a lot of participation uh, at that meeting. I know there's a lot of people looking forward to that. Do we have any questions for Ms. Purdy on her, on her update while she's here with us? All right, it doesn't appear so, but uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Always great to see you, Angie, and we'll talk to you soon. Do we have any further updates from uh, departments here this evening. Looks like we've got a few on the call, but I don't know if anyone's interested in making a departmental update. I will assume not. So we'll move on and I'm not seeing any hands raised. So uh, that will conclude our departmental updates uh, section. We'll now move on to item six, which is council Liaison updates. We have any council members with reports for us uh, this evening? Okay. I have one. Yes, Ms. Wilkes. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to kind of let people know about the um, work that's going on in our community um, that's being funded by a grant through IU Health Foundation and run uh, in cooperation with um, CJAM. And Councillor Deckard and I are on an advisory council for this project and it's the Community Voices for Health Monroe County. And it's a really exciting, innovative project that's taking kind of a, a long, deep look into um, how people in our community view health and the systems around health and the barriers to health equity. Um, so we've had a series of meetings here and there um, over the past several months, and it's um, just something to be on your radar. There'll be um, 
a lot of interesting data coming out of this project and hopefully some uh, really uh, good recommendations once we get to the policy uh, phase of this study. I don't know if, um, Trent, if you have any other details on it, but I just thought it's an exciting thing to talk about. So I wanted to share. I Thank you very much, Councillor Wiltz. I, I would only add that the really cool thing about this project is I think they really, when they're doing their listening sessions, conducting those forums, they're offering people across this county, this community, the chance to weigh in on their healthcare experience and do so in a really, really uh, constructive, I, I don't want to use the word therapeutic, but it's almost therapeutic way to talk about their experiences. And it is mind blowing how across different groups, economic status, uh, this side, that side, downtown of the county, how much, uh, much of the story is extremely similar and they're giving voices to that. And it's, it's been a real pleasure to assist them in a small way along with Councillor Wiltz. Thank you. And thank you both for the, uh, for the information there, very good. Any further liaison reports from council members? All right, seeing none, we will now move on to item seven. We have a few requests here from our health department. Sorry, I'm getting there. Pardon me. Okay, Council, I move to approve the Health Department's request to create new account lines and to simultaneously approve additional appropriations in Fund 8181-9622 IMM Long-Term COVID in the amount of $50,880.46 in the supplies category and $248,416 in the third in 34 cents in the services category for a grand total of $299,296.80. And the name of that fund is actually, um, oh, in the, the name of the lines are supplies and immunization expenses. Second. All right, we have a motion in a second. We have joining us tonight. Rowe County Health Administrator, Penny Caudill. Welcome, Ms. Caudill. Thank you, and thanks for uh, hearing this tonight. This We get immunization funds every year, and with COVID, the state has uh, found additional immunization money. This uh, fund is actually expected to be added to and to run longer through like 2024. Uh, and really most of this will put towards some additional nursing staff, uh, perhaps some community health workers to help focus on continued immuniz immunizations, and especially around uh, continued outreach with COVID-19 as we kind of reach a phase where these mass clinics will kind of go away and we'll be gathering and getting our immunizations through more normal routes. But we know that Right now, it's going out and getting those few people. So we're not doing uh, big clinics necessarily, but we're getting 10 or 20 or 50 people at a time. And we will continue to, to do that. We don't know yet if we will need booster shots. And so the, this may allow us to have additional staff for that if that's needed. Um, and there are some very specific things, promotion, uh, some monitoring, of uh, facilities for the state if, um, if people are giving immunizations. So there are various pieces to this, but just know that for the most part, this will go to staff. And that is through our partnership with the IU Health and the Public Health Clinic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or uh, remarks from council members, Mr. Iverson? I saw your hand first. Yeah, Penny, thank you for bringing this to us. Um, I'm excited to see vaccination funds being coming or coming here. Uh, in the foreseeable future, where can people go to schedule their vaccine if they haven't already gotten one? Certainly. So IU Simon Scott Assembly Hall is still open um, and has lots of availability, is easy to get to. Um, 
ourshot.in.gov is still the best place to go uh, look at all the various facilities that are available to get your vaccine. You can go to local pharmacies. We are starting as well. When you go on that site map, you will find our Monroe County Public Health Clinic that is located on Miller Drive, part of IU Health. Um, on Mondays, there will be appointments uh, in the clinic. Uh, so we'll have kind of a standard set time for that. And then we continue to do outreach clinics and I should have brought my list of them. We have a ton that we have done and plenty more that are, are coming. Um, and we try to post those and share that uh, kind of as they are coming up. So stay tuned for those. There are lots of opportunities, but IU um, Assembly Hall is probably the easiest and easiest to get to, to find, and plenty of uh, vaccinations available at this time. I would really encourage folks listening to follow the health department on Facebook. Uh, uh the staff is doing an amazing job of not only posting uh, details about upcoming clinics, but also nice little tidbits of data um, uh, about the local area. So it's a great uh, page to follow. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And, and to echo what Ms. Cottle said, uh, my wife and I both got our uh, both rounds of vaccines at uh, the assembly hall. It was extraordinarily uh, efficient. The process was there. And you know, I, I still talk to a lot of it. some people in the community think that because it's on the IU campus, it's just limited to IU employees. It's absolutely not. Uh, yeah. Lots of parking available, and it's an extremely efficient process over there. So I was really, really impressed. They, they have been a fabulous partner, and that was a partnership and a collaboration they did not have to do and, and make an offer to do. So we're very grateful uh, for that. Any further uh, questions or comments from Ms. Caudill on this request? Is there any public comment? We'll do a roll call vote, please. Okay. On the motion to approve new account lines and simultaneously approve additional appropriations in fund 8181-9622. Councilor Hawk. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Okay. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. All right, thank you. And next up is uh, item 7B. Council, I move to approve the health department's request to create a new account line and to simultaneously approve an additional appropriation in fund 8182-9621 IMM vaccine outreach in the amount of $43,813.07 in the services category. Second. All right, we have a motion to second. Go ahead. Sorry about that. I didn't mean no to, to cut you off. This is, a uh, once again, additional uh, COVID vaccine funds, uh, very short term. So the grant cycle is kind of March through June, but it was in response to setting up some mass clinics. Um, and we really ended up doing just several various outreach clinics. And uh, this, I believe, is going to be, it was set up, kind of looks like reimbursable, but it's more of a deliverable measure. So we should be able to do one claim for it and get that money. Uh, but again, just goes for um, staffing primarily to help support those clinics uh, because we, we have uh, taking every opportunity we can to get those those clinics set up and take on extra vaccine. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Cottle. Any questions or comments on this request? Is there any public comment? All right, we'll have a roll call vote, please. On the motion to approve a new account line and simultaneously approve additional appropriation in fund 8182, Dash nine six two one. Councillor Iverson. Yes. Councillor Spoonmore. Yes. Councillor Munson. Yes. Councillor Dickard. Yes. Councillor Wiltz. Yes. Councillor Hawk. Yes. Councillor McKim. Yes. 
Motion passed seven to zero. Thank All you. Right. Up next is item 7C. Council, I move to approve the health department's request for an additional appropriation in fund 9130-0000 syringe services program in the amount of $25,000 in the supplies category. Second. All right. This is money that we have received every year since we started our syringe service program. It comes from the Greater Health Foundation of Indianapolis. Uh, the awards each year have ranged uh, as little as 5,000 to this one is our largest at $25,000 and will be used for a syringe service program that is in Monroe County. Very good. Thank you. Any questions? or comments, uh, Councillor Hawk, and then Mr. Iverson and Mr. Deckard. Yes, uh, Ms. Carroll, uh, can any of these dollars be used to help address uh, the uh, needles that are discarded by the users and being found in many places, including our parks and uh, near the school grounds and on the trails? Uh, in some way that we can assist our citizens. They're very concerned. These funds are specifically for supplies, although we do have uh, funds and have, as a department, uh, have partnered with the city uh, to put disposal units out in various parks and public places. Uh, we take calls and have staff that go out and assist in picking up any uh, discarded needles that we may find and can offer sharps containers as well. Uh, so there, there is funding that is going out to the community uh, and between staff, funding for staff time that's going out uh, to address those calls, but also to sharps containers throughout the community. And that's even funds that we've used with Sophia Travis, uh, funds we've received in the past have been used to uh, purchase uh, sharps containers for disposal. My, my hope was that perhaps there would be some way that we could reach out to the users of the needles that that we would let them know how essential it is that they be cooperative uh, with this needle exchange. Uh, Absolutely, and they are. And participants do get their own sharps containers as well. Um, there, there are a variety of things that go into needles that may be dis, uh, disposed of improperly. And what I would say the biggest thing that we hear from people who are using injection drugs is that it is the fear of a felony. So probably the best change that could occur is to not make possession of that needle a felony. And I think you would find that people would be less um, afraid of uh, having that needle on them and might hang on to it and discard it in a more appropriate way. Okay, Any, uh, Mr. Iverson, you're next. Yeah, uh, this is a, a, a great program, of course, and I'm uh, fully supportive of it. Um, is this a renewable grant? It, it is, it has been for us. Um, the Health Foundation has been uh, very, very generous to us. And as I said, we have uh, received funds from them every year since uh, I, we started, I think in 2016, officially um, was approved in 2015. And so we have received funds from them every year. And if I could ask a follow-up question, uh, can community partners also apply for this grant funding, particularly those uh, that are doing harm reduction in the community? I'm thinking of Indian Recovery Alliance and others. Yeah, these funds do go uh, really through us to the Indiana Recovery Alliance. Uh, okay. They come to the health department and usually cover the supplies for the program. Excellent, this is wonderful. I can't praise this enough, this is great. Mr. Decker. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Cottle for being here on these three items. I just wanted to make a quick comment for any member of the public that are watching council meetings one of the huge things that we do is serve as, as part of the county's 
uh, receipt of these dollars that either come from federal sources, sometimes state sources on behalf of federal sources, and then sometimes from members of the not-for-profit community that may not even be from this community. And if you'll track our agendas, you will see any number of uh, those things happening in any number of departments. But I think we're acutely aware of it, particularly with the health department. And these are dollars coming home to this community to help the lives of the people that live in this community and uh, are dealing with all manner of issues. And it's neat to watch this. If you follow the health department for a year and these things coming, Ms. Cottle explaining these things, what's happening, uh, it, it's an incredible thing to see those resources driven home and particularly the cooperation between the many branches of government that, that are here. So uh, just a, a comment I wanted to make. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Deckard. Uh, Ms. Wills. <laughs> Thanks. I had a question, um, Ms. Cottle, about the funding sources that um, I'm under the impression that that the, the federal and, and state monies that kind of pass through go for the sharps containers, but not so much for syringes themselves. And um, that perhaps there are some hiccups and, and, and barriers now uh, emerging in funding the syringes themselves. I wanted to know if that was the case and if you've been able to find other funding sources or what are your greatest needs in that area? Yes, and that has been a, a need from the beginning that state or federal funds cannot be used uh, to actually supply the syringes, but it can be used to provide other supplies. Uh, these are private dollars, so they can be used to purchase any of the supplies that may, need, may be needed. And it has been used in some years to pay for liability insurance. It's been used some years to pay for actual syringes. So it varies from year to year in terms of what the need is. Great. So this money is able to be used more flexibly. Yes. Great. Good to know. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I've got um, I've got a question, and it's more related, just kind of the syringe uh, services program in general. And I think if you you know if we're paying attention to the data uh, surrounding these sorts of programs, uh, it's clear that they're effective in uh, reducing rates of transmission for you know. HIV, hepatitis, and so forth. Do you, do you, I know you've, you've been extraordinarily busy keeping track of lots of data uh, over the last year. And, you know, this is just one of those uh, areas that, that you look at and, and you have interest in. And I hate to put you on the spot. Do you have the, any data that you can share on how effective this uh, program has been here locally for us? Because, and I, I asked that in the lens of, uh, I know that there's other jurisdictions in Indiana right now, some that were at the epicenter of really serious issues going on with HIV infection. Uh, and they're thinking about, you know, revert or terminating these, these types of programs, which I think is very short-sighted. But I'd just like to hear kind of your opinion and what the data is telling us. Yeah, I, I did not come prepared to, to give you that data, so I, I would have to do it off the top of my head, but I can tell you that having, having the facility uh, and the programs that we have, whether it's our staff doing harm reduction outreach, whether it's through Indiana Recovery Alliance, there are numerous HIV tests, hepatitis C testing that is occurring, um, many referrals, uh, and it's the relationships. A lot of it is about the relationships that you build with uh, participants that come in that you know may be ready at some point to make a change uh, in some way, what, whatever that change is, big or small. Uh, but that, that rapport that you build and the opportunity to know that it's a safe place to come and ask a question, get a referral, uh, can make a huge difference. And know that there's testing available if you need an HIV test or a hepatitis test, uh, that we can get those for you. Um, we have staff that go out and do that testing. Uh, so those things are, are huge benefits. And, you know, the, 
misconception I think that we, we talk about often is that people think of it as just a needle exchange and it is so much more. And that's why it's a syringe service program because there are lots of referrals and other pieces to that. The exchange of that syringe is just a small part of it. So I don't have the exact numbers. I can certainly pull together some data and share that with you. Um, as a department update in an upcoming sure. meeting can certainly do that. Okay, thank you. And again, sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. It just kind of, as we're talking about these things, it, it comes up and, uh, but yeah, that would, that would be great. Any other questions or comments for Ms. Cottle on this request? Any public comment? And it looks like we do uh, have uh, Mr. Shelton, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Jim Shelton with the Chamber. The Chamber urges you to approve this. We've been a strong supporter of this program from the very beginning. This program has been a great benefit to the businesses and been a great partner with businesses, especially those located downtown who, who are mostly the ones who have to deal with this. In an education point of view, but also in providing uh, boxes to drop off these devices. And uh, we strongly support it. We think it's a very smart thing to be doing. You've heard from Mr. Deckard and others that this is, it has nothing to do with whether somebody's using the needle or not, it has, or for what they're using it. I use them for being a diabetic myself, and I have a Sharps container in my garage. But uh, this is just a really smart thing to do to help keep our businesses viable and to keep people safe who are trying to use them. And uh, I hope you'll support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelton, for your comments. Do you have any further public comment on this item? Okay, seeing none, we will uh, do a roll call vote, please. On the motion to approve an additional appropriation in Fund 9130-0000. Councilor Wilt? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ms. Collie. Have a good evening. All right, up next is item eight, uh, our Board of Commissioners. Council, I move to approve the Board of Commissioners request for an additional appropriation in Fund 1000-0068, General Fund Commissioners in the amount of $35,000 in the services category. Second. All right, and Ms. Purdy rejoins us. Welcome back. Uh, what additional information do you have for us on this request? And I see Commissioner Thomas has joined us as well too. Welcome, Ms. Thomas. Yes, thank you. Um, well, this request is coming about twofold. Um, first of all, we had not anticipated um, a contract with Capital Assets, a, um, a um, facility or lobbyist for the county, um, which is which will come to thirty nine thousand five hundred fifteen dollars for the year. Um, we also and is not included in this particular request is. Um, all of the expenses um, that may be associated with an annexation fiscal report. So I might be back. All right, thank you. Ms. Thomas, any, anything? Okay. Any I'm questions? Just here to answer questions and to <laughs> encourage you to please support this. Got it. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council? Uh, council Member Hawk and then Mr. McKim. Yes, so you're saying it's only just these two. I thought there was something about uh, additional dollars having to do with that lawsuit that we were in the middle of. No. Um, that's, that's a different item. That's the legal I'm next. I'm sure I'm on the right item. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. McCann and then Ms. Wilts. So what kind of, so assuming the contract for the, um, uh, the annexation fiscal analysis is 50,000, what, how much more do you think you'd need to come back for next time? I mean, I understand that that contract came in too late for the advertisement, so we weren't able to 
handle it all here. But what do you what do you think uh, in terms of your ability to move things around? What what are we what are we looking at? Um, I've already transferred ten thousand or, or requested ten thousand transferred into this line um, from a training line. So just on that information alone, we would be at forty thousand for a request. But actually, I believe that you know the thirty nine thousand five hundred fifteen. We've already spent, we've already actually paid um, $18,000 of that. So 21 is what's actually needed to get us through the rest of the year for, for capital. And, um, you know, we've already expended, you know, there were some other expenses that we hadn't anticipated on a radon test for the Johnson Hardware building. Um, and that was not inexpensive. Um, so I think that you know, it's possible that, you know, we could get conservatively come back for 30 more, um, maybe more realistically, truly 50, which would also include some um, additional meetings for the public. I'm just kind of guessing on that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So 30 to 50. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm looking at, got it. Okay, okay. Uh, Ms. Waltz? Uh, she answered my question. Thank you. Got it. Any further questions or comments from council? We have any public comment? Seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote, please. Okay. On the motion to approve an additional appropriation in fund 1000-0068. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our next item is number nine, legal department. I think this is what uh, Council Councilor Hawk was inquiring about earlier. Council, I move, hi. I move to approve the legal department's request for an additional appropriation in fund 1000-0277 general fund legal in the amount of $15,000 in the services category. Second. Hello, I'm excited to bring you an item that you guys are just so excited to hear about that you're wanting to skip ahead. Um, but the legal department has a request in front of you for $15,000 for an additional appropriation. We have about four cases that are pending in litigation that are costing uh, dollars. And um, we expect that we'll need additional money before the end of the year. So we pay for outside counsel with these dollars. We pay for mediation. Uh, court reporter fees if we have, um, you know, if we have, um, let's say a deposition, um, if we need a transcript. And these are all cases that we've taken on um, on behalf of various departments at the county, some for planning, uh, some for the commissioners and environmental commission. Um, I'll tell you, we do our very best to stay out of the courtroom and out of litigation if we can. But when our clients wish for us to pursue cases on their behalf, we do that. And there's a price tag that comes along with that. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. We don't have any bills due right now, um, but we expect that we will have another mediation coming up this year. And um, one of our cases might have an oral argument in front of federal uh, district court so if those come to fruition, we are gonna need the extra dollars. So happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Any uh, council members have questions or comments on this request, the $15,000 request for litigation? Mr. McKim? I, I, I guess this is a, a comment more than anything, and I apologize, and this is nothing against the legal department, but I'm going to be voting no on this one just because I'm, I'm concerned about the excessive uh, 
uh, costs of the uh, Forest Service litigation. But I, I you know, I, I don't, I, I know you have to pay your bills and you have to do your job. So please just take that comment as opposition to that lawsuit. Yeah, I could appreciate that. And I can tell you that that, um, we've had conversations with outside counsel about the case and the costs. We did, it was a strategic decision to pursue an Endangered Species Act claim as well as our original claim um, because we felt as if there was in fact a violation of the Endangered Species Act. So that caused that litigation to um, be a little bit higher than we originally expected. Um, but because we felt as if um, the, you know, certain bats in Indiana were not being protected per federal law, we felt it was important enough for our community to pursue that prong of the litigation. And so that if you see a little bit of sticker shock and you see that the litigation is higher than we originally estimated, that's um, because of that. And we also have seen some really creative and interesting arguments on the other side that we felt it was worth, um, worth going after, so. And, and what is that? Right. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Number, what is that number so far? Um, you know, I was just actually adding up the invoices. It's a little, it's upwards of 90,000. Um, and um, the, again, if we have an oral argument, then, you know, we'll obviously have to prepare for that and have uh, outside counsel present the oral argument. I don't know whether the court will ask for an oral argument or if they will just decide on the briefs. Everything's been fully briefed and um, we are simply waiting on the court's judgment and we'll see if they, um, if they do ask for an oral argument. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hawk. Yes, um, I too will be voting no on this. Um, was not in favor of doing this to begin with. This is not even in our county. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, an egregious way to spend local tax dollars because we're just we're just spinning our wheels here. Uh, it if it was right here where we could do something about it, it would be different. Uh, but when you, I mean, what we're going up against the National Parks Department? Yes, I I just Forest Service. Well, I keep, I, you know, I continue to make it the Parks Department. Uh, however, uh, so I will not be supporting it. And I don't know where we're going with this. And is there going to be an amount over which we will not spend more? Or are we just, is it just an open book? That's a question. Sure, I, I can address that. Um, I think that the last year, COVID has certainly taught us that we're all connected and that what somebody does in one county or one part of the world certainly affects everybody else. And we feel like what the United States Forest Service is doing in a county or two over from us here in Indiana certainly affects us. And so we felt like it was uh, worth, certainly, and this was after consultation with the commissioners and the council, and they gave us the green light to litigate. We felt like it was worth pursuing. Um, our, you know, we, we worry about the, um, the uh, possible, again, reasonable people can disagree. That's why there's, there are lawyers and there's litigation, but we worry about the possible effect on um, Lake Monroe. We worry about the endangered bat. Um, we worry, you know, just in general about our environment and what happens when you burn um, thousands of acres of forest and cut down, um, a lot of trees in our in our largest national forest in, in Indiana. So once we got the green light from the commissioners and the council, we felt like it was worth pursuing. And um, I don't think that it's, you know, that there's a blank check that we have no limit. Um, but once you start something, it's worth doing it right. And we're gonna finish what we started, provided that you guys provide the funds. As I said, though, we don't have any existing bills related to this case right now. Um, so I don't want you to think that this $15,000 that you're appropriating is going only for this case, which some of you might find controversial. We have a sign case. We have another um, case down at Lake Monroe involving cutting some timber. Um, we have a case in which an apartment complex occupied property before they had permits. 
Um, and all of those things require us to litigate, to enforce local and state law. And in some cases, we're arguing that the federal government should follow the federal law. Call me crazy. But as a lawyer, I think the law should be followed. And whether it's the uh, property owner or the federal government that's not following them, I think it's worth pursuing. So we are pursuing those. And um, again, no bills right now that need to be paid, but we expect that as we get closer to the end of the year, we'll have some bills for um, outside counsel and for our our insurance defense counsel that we'll need to pay. Now, if, if for some reason you guys decide you don't wanna approve this tonight or you wanna approve a lower amount, I think that's certainly within your discretion. Um, if you feel like you wanna approve 5,000 or 10,000, right now, I think we have about $65 in our balance. So we'd like to have a little bit more cushion than that. If for some reason you wanna approve a lower amount, that's certainly something you can do. And then we may be back again having this conversation later in the year. But certainly it's your call as the fiscal body to determine how much you want to appropriate tonight. So with the with the Forest Service litigation, I think you mentioned earlier that that's it. The the tab is at 90k on that mm -hmm. right now. As I recall, the original kind of estimate when we were considering this. Uh, at the at the outset last year, um, I think it was 75. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was the Endangered Species Act. You know, and again, the thing with um, litigation is it's some, sometimes complicated, and you don't know what you're getting into until you get started. And then you might find like, ooh, here's an interesting argument. Didn't know um, that that was going to be in the administrative record. And then you see like, all of a sudden, you have a new argument. Um, that you need to make. And so, um, you know, we, um, we felt like the Endangered Species Act argument was important enough to make. And so we pursued that. And that has caused us to, you know, spend a little extra money than we did. Um, but we felt like it, that was an important enough claim to make here in Indiana. So we'll see whether, you know, again, it, it's a bit of a gamble anytime you litigate. Um, but you know, we felt like, and again, it's not as if the attorneys sort of went out and did this on our own. We we did talk to the commissioners of council ahead of time and got the green light to pursue the litigation. And we just want to make sure that we're able to do that, do it well, and do it to the best of our ability. And um, and so, you know, we have um, already paid again upwards of ninety thousand. Don't know if I'll have any more to spend on this case. Um, or if we'll just get a judgment sometime but from the court. Everything has been paid at this point. There's Today, no claims outstanding. No claims outstanding. Now, if, again, um, if we get an order tomorrow from the court that says we're going to have an oral argument on date X, we're going to have to prepare for that oral argument. It's going to take time to prepare, and then we have to show up, and there will be additional costs for that. Don't so, know whether the judge is going to order that or not. Okay. And at that point, we may need to have, you know, a further conversation about, you know, how, what, what would, yeah. uh, what, how, what the strategy would be going forward. But, sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can, and generally speaking, you don't have the option to not show up. If a court tells you you're going to show up and present an oral argument, you need to show up unless you're prepared to withdraw your case. Um, so, yeah, so we would definitely want to show up and be prepared for that. Now, again, I'm, I am loath to litigate in public. So those are the, the kinds of things we would we would have um, in, uh, we would do whatever we could legally um, in an executive session to make sure that we were protecting attorney client confidentiality. Right, okay, yeah. okay, great, thank you. I, I, I know Ms. Wiltz had a question. I think she was first in line and then Mr. Deckard and Mr. Ivers. Uh, Thanks. I'll just keep this brief. Um, I, I just want to express my support for this uh, lawsuit, um, my continued interest in it, and our community's continued interest in it. Um, when it comes down to it, um, Ms. Rice, you, you've made you've made better arguments than I can, for sure, and I appreciate you laying it out. Um, 
even though that's not really the topic we're on right now. But I just wanted to um, express that I get my drinking water from Lake Monroe. So I have a personal interest in, in making sure that that uh, water source is protected to the highest standard of the law. And we're talking about just, you know, making sure that the, uh, the management agencies are, are being held accountable using the processes set in place to do that. So for me, this seems very reasonable and um, I appreciate the work that you're doing on it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think Ms. Munson is actually first in line. Thank you. I'll just be very brief and say, I too am in support of this. I, I wish there wasn't an additional expense and um, I think I think the real crux of this is that there is wide public support for taking care of Lake Monroe, including dealing with this uh, Forest Service action, which will take place over uh, many years. It's not just a one-time operation. It's a, it's a long-range plan. And I think we have to be responsible when we know that Lake Monroe is our drinking water supply and is such a critical uh, economic asset to, to our community. Many people were surprised, but have been learning that if they don't uh, live in the city, they still are getting city of Bloomington water from Lake Monroe. And that is because the wholesalers, uh, various water delivery companies, supply companies, uh, get their water from Lake Monroe. So you may be living at the far reaches of uh, Monroe County, but still have city water, uh, in essence, flowing out of your taps. And we all are concerned about what is in our water. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Munson. Um, Mr. Deckard. Thank you very much. And uh, I, there's been some great comments and I just wanna to add to it because I, I am aware that there might be outside folks watching this and I want, I, I want to be clear on, on why I've supported this, this funding continuously. Um, great arguments have been articulated. This is our water supply. And I'll take it one step further. If you follow the history in this county and community on our efforts to guarantee a water supply. And I'll walk with you out at Leonard Springs. We can take a look at that water supply and the many others. We have had a difficult time when things were not secure. Um, piggyback or moving forward just to today, if we would ever, or they would ever, which is it worse, if they would ever make a mistake that would affect our water supply, it would be catastrophic for this community. And I can't emphasize that enough. So at the very least, and, and the cost to that would make this look like just a bad Saturday afternoon um, where you spend a couple dollars extra. So at the very least, um, if we bring pause to how this process works that affects our water supply, uh, I think that th that has, has been a success. And the last thing I'll say is, for those that can remember in this community, the story of PCBs when outside entities made decisions about things that ultimately affected us, we just have to be very careful and cautious always moving forward. And hopefully this uh, wraps up in a, a positive way for all concerned. Thank you, Mr. Decker, Mr. Iverson, and then Mr. McKim. Uh, I'm in support of this uh, this measure, and uh, I know that the Environmental Commission, while not able to be here tonight, is also in support of this. Um, and so I wanted to voice uh, the support from the community from that perspective as well. Uh, I, looking as how close it is to 6.30, so I'm going to not give a lecture on uh, sustainability. All right, thank you, Mr. Iverson, Mr. Kim. So I've heard several of my colleagues mention the, the, our water supply and the city as the provider of our, of our drinking water that uses Lake Monroe and the supplies to the rural uh, water companies, which is certainly true. So what is the city's role in 
supporting this lawsuit? What city Bl Bloomington Utilities? Do they mm -hmm. are they out there testifying? Are they strongly in support of this? Do they feel like this project is a threat to our water supply? Um, I think I think you may be aware that Vic Kelson, um, I think said publicly that he was not asked about this litigation and maybe even didn't even think there was a threat to the water supply. Thank you. Uh, reasonable people, though, may disagree. And I agree with that. I just, I, I, there was a lot of um, kind of dramatic language about a threat to our water supply. And I just want to make sure that that threat has not been necessarily established by fact. Yeah, I mean, if, if it were established by fact, we wouldn't be litigating. I mean, most people realize that the reason you litigate is because there's a question. There might be a question of fact, there might be a question of law. And when it comes to a situation where we are talking about, you know, burning thousands of acres, cutting thousands of acres, possibly endangering our water, possibly endangering um, an endangered species, we felt like the benefits outweighed the risk of litigating. And again, reasonable people can disagree. And, and so we'll see what happens with this litigation and whether the Forest Service prevails. The, the point is we wanna make sure that the federal law is followed, that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and that the federal uh, government does not get sloppy in Indiana and that we're holding them accountable. I think it's worthwhile. Ms. Hawk, you're next. Yes, just as a reminder that uh, in order to make an impact with any of this, it needs to be a regional thing. We, we are not in control of that lake. We love to call it Lake Monroe, but it is not our lake. And we need to have a regional approach might be able to get someplace with it that way. Uh, but we don't have a regional approach. And, and it's because the other uh, folks in the watershed do not appear to want to join in with us. And until we get to that point, uh, it's sort of like, you know, don't make the pool over here on my side yellow. You can keep it yellow over there on your side. It doesn't work that way. But um, anyway, time is of the essence, so we need to just vote on this. Mm -hmm. um, I would say from a regional perspective, we do have Indiana Forest Alliance and Hoosier Environmental Council that also joined yes. as plaintiffs. And so they do have a, a more regional perspective. And they're also plaintiffs. I'm just talking about the other counties because you can have any whatever. If you don't get the other counties, everybody working together, we're spinning our wheels. But that's my opinion, and I get to have it. Thank you. Do we have anything further from council on this request? Seeing none, uh, is there any public comment? I don't see any public comment, so we'll have a roll call vote, please. On the motion to approve an additional appropriation in fund 1000 0277, Councillor Hawk. No. Councillor McKim? No. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Dickard? Yes. Motion passed five to two. Thank you. I appreciate all your comments. Thank you, Ms. Rice. And uh, wow, we couldn't have timed this any better. Uh, we're one minute away from our 6.30 time frame that we had set up. And I see Mr. Cockrell is here. So uh, we are on to item uh, 9B now. Item 9B, uh, council. I move that the council review and discuss the status of ongoing tax abatements pursuant to Indiana Code 6-1.1 6 .1 to 12.1 at SEC resolution 2021-27 and establish its findings as to whether or not the abatement recipients are in compliance with their statements of benefits for the continuance of abatements in the 2021 pay 2022 tax year and to give the council president permission to sign the CF1 forms regarding the council's decision 
beginning with um, 3D Stone. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, County Attorney Jeff Cockrell is joining us tonight. Welcome, Mr. Cockrell. Well, thank you. And I, and I noticed you started with 3D Stone. I just sent a message to the company rep because I do not see him as part of the panelists or attendees right now. So I was wondering if it would be beneficial if I if we went through the other three first while he's trying to get on. Mm -hmm. I know he indicated that he may be somewhere where it'd be difficult for him to get on due to cell service and and that kind of stuff. So he is going to make every mm -hmm. attempt to make it. And I want to give him a little bit more time to, to get on if, if that's all right with the council. Absolutely. I amend my uh, motion to, instead of 3D Stone, refer to bioconvergence. Second. Okay. Well, bio, and this, I'm going to give a little preamble that will apply to all four of these. On Friday, we met with the Economic Development Commission to review the CF1 forms. And uh, I believe they, they have given a recommendation for three of the four, one they forward without recommendation and that's 3D Stone. And that is partly due to the fact that we didn't get that CF1 form until um, midday Thursday. And uh, I, while I had talked to the company rep, he wasn't able to make it, but he indicated that he was gonna try to make this council meeting tonight. And they wanted you to have the, the full um, information and didn't wanna kind of, make a decision based upon uh, less than that. So that's that's kind of what's going on with the 3D stone. The other three, they recommended approval. Um, bioconvergence, which is the first one uh, we're talking about tonight. This, this is a fairly old tax abatement. I think it may even be in its last year. Uh, this is a personal property only. Um, if you look at the statement of benefits and compare it to the compliance uh, form, you'll notice that the employment numbers are down. Um, and people who have been on the council for a while, this will come, that will come as no shock to them. You'll also notice that the investments a little bit uh, or is down from what they originally anticipated. That was because when they first started, uh, their original plan included a, an additional um, processes that were um, made part of a different local business that they did not want to compete with. And so they had curtailed that part of it. And so it lowered the investment and, 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 loyal, and it lowered the employment. Um, this has gone through the council and that explanation has gone through the council several times. I think I even for, I included with the EDC packet um, minutes from the 2017 council meeting where it, it was presented this way and, and, and the, the council at the time uh, said, you know, we, we've heard this, we agree to it and that we're comfortable moving forward with it based upon the, the lower numbers. Uh, these numbers are very comparable to, to, to the ones we've seen in the recent past. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer any on that one. Well, let's check and see. Do we have any questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Kim? Yeah, more of a comment just that we have uh, in earlier meetings uh, over the past couple of years discussed the situation in a in a fair amount of detail. And, um, you know, I think that uh, previous councils have, have always mm -hmm. found the, the explanations to be adequate and, um, you know, that, that bioconvergence made the best they could with a, a you know, with a bad situation um, and uh, that we wanna continue to support them to the degree we can. Very well said. Anything further? All right. Um, is there any, we take public comment on these, right? Yes. Do we have any public comment on this item? No? Okay, so we'll do a roll call vote, please. Um, we technically haven't separated these out. There was, hmm? right? I think Ms. Wilkes indicated the with the amended motion to consider bioconvergence first, mm -hmm. I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her motion on the floor is just for bioconvergence. Oh, okay. I just wanted to make sure. So I read this. Yeah, so read that right there. Okay. On the motion to approve the tax abatement compliance findings for bioconvergence LLC. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor Kim? Yes. 
Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Wilts? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Right. Council, I move to establish that Ecologic is in compliance with its statement of benefits for continuance of abatement and to give the council president Spoonmore permission to sign the CF1 forms to that effect. Second. All right, Mr. Cockrell. Yes, um, if you look at the this compliance form, it indicates that they um, have have 14 uh, employees and the, the goal was they had eight when they applied for it and that they would have eight more. Um, the reason that that 14 is lower than the total promise is due to timing. Um, I called them earlier uh, last week and they had over, they had 20 to 21 employees at that time. Uh, they indicate that they are doing great business right now and that people have become more aware of their mission, which is to um, give uh, native plants and seeds to, to essentially a lot of governmental units and a lot of people who are doing um, property uh, um, landscaping so that the, that the native plants are, are there and that they have 16 full-time employees um, right now, 21, and they had looked at two more each year uh, for the next few years. Their business model works where they have a lot of employees who work eight to 10 months a year because of uh, the nature of their work. And so that's why that number right now is 21 actual employees. But I think if you look at permanent people, I think they're at 16 permanent positions right now. Got it. Any questions or comments on this one? Uh, Ms. Wilkes, yes. Um, I'd just like to say that um, my daughter is one of those recent hires, so I will um, recuse myself <laughs> from this particular vote for that reason. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, information. Uh, Mr. McKim? And how many years left on the abatement for this one? I believe this was a 2000, 17 or 18. I don't have that right off the top of my head, but I bet if I look at the CF1 form, it would tell me. This looks to have been done in 2012 with an estimated completion date in 2013. So this would be towards the end of that. Um, as long as those dates were met, and I, my memory is that they were, although I did not look at that before this meeting. So it would be a 10-year abatement. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Is there any public comment? And seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote. And Ms. Freeman, just uh, a reminder, Ms. Wilts will be abstaining from this vote. Okay. okay. Do you want to call a name? Yes, you still have to call a name. Okay. On the motion to approve the tax abatement compliance findings for Karst Holdings LLC, Ecologic. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Wilt? Abstain. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Motion passed six to zero, or six to one, I'm sorry. Six zero six one. Six zero to one. Yeah. Okay. Six zero one. Okay. All right. Council, I move to establish that. Uh, Provelli is in compliance with its statement of benefits for continuance of abatement and to give Council President Spoonmore permission to sign the CF1 forms to that effect. Second. Go ahead, Ms. Carroll. Yes, yes uh, Provelli, if you recall, was one we just did last year um, mid pandemic. If you notice from their CF1 form, they have increased employment by 33 um, jobs. In their presentation last year, they indicated that their plan was to, for last year to increase it by 25 jobs. So they've kind of met that obligation that they expressed to you guys when, when the abatement was approved. 
um, with that information. That is uh, why the uh, EDC recommended approval of this compliance form. Very good, thank you. Any questions, comments from council on this one? Okay, seeing none. Uh, is there any public comment? No public comment. So we will uh, have a roll call vote, please. On the motion to approve the tax abatement compliance findings for Provelli Incorporated. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Wilds? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Okay, and it appears we may have Mr. Sindek in the uh, attendees group. Is that uh, who, we're, who we're looking for here? Yes. Okay. We're looking, is that? And he's been, Kurt? Kurt, yeah. Yes, I'm here. Okay. All Great. Right. Council, I move to um, establish that 3D Stone is in compliance with its statement of benefits for continuance of abatement and to give Council President Spoonmore permission to sign the CF1 forms to that effect. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Cockerell, do you want to get started? Yeah, I, I, I will. Um, when we looked at this compliance form, we noticed that the employment figures weren't what were what were expressed on the statement of benefits one, SB1, which is the statement of benefits. That's kind of what they give at the initial onset to say, hey, this is what we're going to do and this is why you should give us an abatement. Um, their numbers were much lower. Uh, we met with, the, I met when I, we met with the EDC last Friday. We had a, a bit of discussion about this. Um, I had talked to Mr. Sendak before that meeting and, and I'll let him kind of explain um, the struggles they are having. Um, but I think the reason for the not for the no recommendation, again, that's not a negative, but just you know forwarding it along, uh, was because they they wanted to make sure that the council had that communication with the company, um, but to make a decision. Um, maybe to kind of preview what. Kurt will say what he told me what had to do with uh, trouble find not the fact that they didn't want to hire the people but they just had trouble finding people who could come in and do the job in a safe and appropriate manner and that um, they are in the process of becoming an ESOP so with that set up I'll let Kurt kind of explain what's going on yes uh, thank you and welcome Mr. Sindek Thank you very much. Uh, yes, basically, um, you know, we would, we've been looking for people. We've been trying to hire people. We've been working with um, uh, the, the uh, high school, uh, I can't remember what they're called, where they, where they teach them trades in, in, in high school. Vocational programs, yeah. Vocational. We've been working with Ivy Tech. Uh, we've actually just recruited two students uh, from a, trade school down in South Carolina that just started last week. Uh, they're going through internships or they're calling them externships uh, to, uh, you know, start uh, trying to train the next generation. Uh, we've been trying to find CNC operators, skilled laborers, uh, even unskilled laborers, and been uh, running ads in the newspaper, running ads all over social media. Uh, it's just been very difficult to, in fact, even on um, in February, we increased our payroll and gave uh, large pay raises uh, to all of our employees. And it's just been uh, very difficult to find anybody that's uh, willing to come in uh, and, and work. We hire people, um, you know, if they come in from jail with ankle bracelets on, we're, we're hiring them. Um, but yeah, we basically have been unable to find skilled laborers and or even unskilled uh, people to run crane op cranes and we train them. And uh, we have purchased uh, additional two CNCs compared to what we had originally projected just because uh, it's um, trying to compensate for the lack of labor that, uh, that we just can't be able to find. So that was the nepotist for us to continue to uh, 
become an ESOP corporation because at this point we'll be uh, giving the employees the profits and the and the the shares of the corporation over the next 25 years to um, try and gain um, momentum with with employments uh, and uh, we're just about ready to try and figure out how to you know get it with the news and the you know other things to try and uh, promote the ESOP and hopefully we can gain higher level of employment. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, we'll check now and see if there's any questions or comments uh, from council. And I see uh, council member McKim and then council member Hawk. Thank you very much uh, for that explanation. I, I feel for you guys and the struggles you've had, I know, in, in, in finding people. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to support the support your business and continue to support this abatement. I just uh, was had a question about the ESOP, dude. What, what's your target for what percentage of the company would be uh, owned by the ESOP? Uh, we're actually going 100% ESOP. Excellent. Great. Thank you. That's great to hear. Thank you. And if, and if anybody has any suggestions on how I can, um, you know, publicize this and and kind of show. Um, you know, the marketplace that uh, this is happening and, you know, news channels, I would think somebody maybe would love to get a, a, a positive story once in a while. We'd like to kind of share this with the, with the public. Yeah. I, I worked for an ESOP for uh, 25 years and uh, I, I, uh, I appreciate how important a, a motivator that is and how, how great it is for the employees to have that kind of a, a stake in the profits of the business. Well, that's excellent. I'm glad. I'm glad. Given the limestone heritage that we have uh, here in this community, that's that's terrific to hear. So, uh, Ms. Hawk, and then Mr. Iverson. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you for just hanging in there with uh, just trying to make sure that you've done all you can to make make this work. And uh, what I wanted to do was ask uh, Mr. Cockrell to uh, explain why. Uh, and I don't know the exact wording, but if it is a situation that is beyond the control of the uh, person who has a tax abatement, that you can move forward with this. So you want to tell us exactly the wording on that, Mr. Cockrell? Well, I think the, the wording is that the individual, that the, the council has to find that they were in noncompliance and it were it was not due to factors beyond the company's control. So they basically have to find that, and that's a statutory language. Mm -hmm. I always rephrase it as, you've got to find that, that the reason they are not in compliance was under their control. And I think beyond that, I think you have to find that, and, and bioconvergence that we talked about earlier is a perfect example. You know, there, there was some control there, but they made the right decision and that, you know, as the fiscal body and as the person who grants the abatement, if it's even if it's within their control, which I which I'm not saying this one is, then if you think they did the right thing, then you you can go ahead and and continue to approve the abatement. It's really a dramatic step to remove a tax abatement, and it generally involves um, behavior that that the government shouldn't support. I guess would be the, the best way to phrase it. Thank you. Mr. Iverson and then Ms. Munson. Uh, Mr. Sendick, thank you uh, for being here tonight. Um, and I, I certainly uh, appreciate hearing um, what you're going through. Uh, I, and it's a story that we're hearing not just um, from your company, but other companies, and also not just in Monroe County, but across the state and probably if we uh, you know, listened a little harder, we'd hear it across uh, the Midwest too. Um, and my question to you is uh, that you talked a lot about acquiring new employees. Have you been having similar struggles with retaining employees? Um, we actually recently just lost two employees to a competitor. Um, we had uh, a couple employees that uh, had uh, convictions and and are are in jail uh other than that we've been pretty successful at retaining uh the the majority of the employees that we have and and uh, we we i would say probably 50 percent of the people that we had five years ago are, 
are still with us. And, and then some of those positions churn, yeah. but yeah. Good. We well, thank you. Hope ESOP helps that though. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Munson. I just wanted to um, say that I will be supporting this and I want to thank uh, 3D Stone and their leadership and their employees for being good neighbors in the southwestern part of the county. They keep their property looking very spiffy and additionally they go way beyond their property in uh, keeping the roadsides uh, picked up. And I wanna say thank you for that. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, anything for uh, Mr. Decker? Thank you very much. I'll also be supporting this. And I, I just want to add, I, I think that your industry has been in a, a state uh, for some time, some considerable time of, of figuring things out. And it sounds like uh, you're still in that process. And we appreciate everything that you're trying to do to figure that out uh, with the ESOP. Um, this is precisely the kind of thing a uh, county council can do to support a workforce that's trying to figure things out and get to the next point. I appreciate you coming here to tell the story. You may have more attention than you want as a result of some of this, um, <laughs> but, but, I, but I'm sure that's the least of the headaches that you have on a day. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, anything further from council? Any public comment? Uh, seeing none, we will have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Freeman. On the motion to approve the tax abatement compliance findings for 3D Stone. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Hawk. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Have a good evening. And Thank up you. next will be item 10 in our highway department. Council, I move to approve the highway department's request for a midpoint hire of the stormwater inspection position in fund 1197 dash 0000 stormwater management to, and to simultaneously amend the 2021 salary ordinance stormwater inspector 40 hours pat four exempt to a midpoint higher status. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. MS4 coordinator Kelsey Petonia is joining us tonight. Welcome Ms. Petonia. Good evening council members, thank you. I'm really happy to say that we have a very qualified candidate for the stormwater inspector position. Um, they came in with the most direct experience performing inspections and other aspects of the job duties, as well as having complementary experience with water quality monitoring, environmental permitting, and other asset management duties. So um, I am thrilled to be able to come to you with this request. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, we'll see if there's any questions or comments on the request and any questions or comments from council? All right. Uh, do we have any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote, please. On the motion to hire at midpoint for the stormwater inspector position and simultaneously amend 2021 salary ordinance in fund 1197-0000. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you. Well, have a good evening. Thank you. All right, and up next is item 11, uh, Youth Services Bureau. We've got uh, a couple of items from YSB. Council, I move to approve the Youth Service Services Bureau's request to create new account lines and to simultaneously approve additional appropriations 
and fund 9111-9621-1503 grant YSB in the amount of $39,863 in the personnel category. Second. All right, welcome uh, back to the council, Mr. Malone. Thank you. Um, thank you for having us. We are here, we, this is a grant that we write for as part of the, mem we're members of the Indiana Youth Services Association, IYSA, and there are uh, IYSA funds that are available. We have to write our grant, we were awarded. And so we are trying, hoping to have that appropriated. That is, so there will be, I think the first, this is the first part with 1503 and the second will be 1504, it's the exact same situation. Got it, thank you. Do we have any questions or uh, remarks on this request? Do we, Ms. Munson, did, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Malone, yes. Uh, is, how many years has YSB had a grant from the Indiana Youth Services Association? I will have to check to get the details, but it's been over but, 20. Uh, I, I know uh, we've had it every year that I've been around. I think that, well into the 90s um, and if not earlier. So okay. I will have to check. So this is this is an annual grant that you all count on? We, yes, uh, we typically write for two years at a time. Okay. Um, and this, and we're able to write for anything that supports specifically the emergency shelter services. So this grant is for our um, a part of our case manager position, mm -hmm. and yes. for hourly funds that go directly to working with the kids on the floor in Big Bear. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything further from council? Do we have any public comment? And uh, Mr. Shelton, welcome back. Good evening again, Council. Jim Shelton uh, with the chamber, but speaking right now is Acasa. Uh, the very first case I ever had is Acasa. Uh, the young man that uh, I was uh, Acasa for needed this service. It's a very important service. It's when, when you need it, it is just critical. The young man had uh, kind of messed up where he had been fostered and uh, the DCS family case manager got a call somehow during the middle of the day from the people that uh, were fostering him and said, this man cannot come home here again tonight. You are gonna have to pick him up from school and take him somewhere else. This is the, this is the facility that was available. And uh, it worked out well for him. We were able to get him into a, a different situation, but that that's too much down the pike but anyhow he did this is a very important uh opportunity for people who need it thank you excellent thank you for your comments mr shelton you have any further public comment seeing none uh we'll do a roll call vote please on the motion to simultaneously create new account lines approve additional appropriations and amend the 2021 salary ordinance in fund 9111-9621. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Excellent. And now we'll move on to uh, the next item for the Youth Services Bureau, item B, 11B. Council, I move to approve the Youth Services Bureau's request to create new account lines and to simultaneously approve additional appropriations in Fund 9103-9622, Project Safe Place, in the amount of $2,500 in the supplies category and $5,000 $418.65 in the services category for a total of $7,918.65. Second. Great. Mr. Malone, do you have any additional information you'd like to share with council on this request? Yes, I wanted to mention a couple of things. One, obviously, this does not fund the entirety of the Safe Place program. We, we want to thank the uh, federal government for funding our Safe Place coordinator position through the RHY grant. 
Um, this is just extra money that is used to, for the services that we have, uh, that we do provide for a safe place. And I'll take the moment to remind people what that yellow and black sign means. That yellow and black sign that you might be really familiar with actually um, extends shelter services throughout the community. So you don't need to get to our building to access the youth workers and the professionals that work there. If you go someplace where you see that yellow and black sign, um, they will call us and we will help you solve your problem, whether that means coming to the shelter or sit, we will always dispatch a volunteer to come meet you where you are. But um, it doesn't mean you come to the shelter. We can help you with a, by talking to a counselor. We can help you um, in any way. Sometimes, honestly, it's just somebody who's scared to go home because they got a bad grade or they, or they, or they don't know what to do uh, in a situation. Sometimes there are people who are bothering them. And sometimes it's a big, it's a much bigger issue. But that extends our services all throughout the community. We have 133 sites, including 21 mobile sites. And that includes uh, all the, uh, the city buses, the bus, the bus, all the transport. You can get on there, say, so you need a safe place, and they will contact us so we can get you help. And that is for any young person, really. We won't turn anybody away, um, all the way up to, uh, in, actually, the, the grant covers into the 20s. But most of the kids that we serve is, uh, are below the age of 18. Great, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We have any uh, questions or comments from council? Okay, do we have any public comment? And it doesn't appear so. We'll do a roll call vote, please. On the motion to approve new account lines and simultaneously approve additional appropriations in fund 9103-9622. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Great. Mr. Malone, have a great evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Okay. And up next is item 12 our Monroe County Public Library. Council, I move to review and discuss the Monroe County Public Library's request to authorize the issuance of bonds and to establish approval of the bonds as per resolution 2021-24 as required pursuant to Indiana Code 6-1.1-17-20.5. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, and I know we have several uh, members from the library here joining us and uh, we'll turn it over uh, to the library group to uh, make their presentation whenever you're ready feel free hello everyone uh, uh, thank you for hearing from the library this evening. Um, I'm Marilyn Wood and I'm the director of Monroe County Public Library. And I'm joined this evening by Greer Carson, the associate director of MCPL, Gary Lettler, the financial manager at the library, as well as Jacob McClellan from Bose McKinney and Evans and Ryan Fetters from Baker and Tilly. <clears throat> what I hope to do tonight uh, is to begin by providing a bit of an overview of how the library has been strengthening our community, even even through the pandemic, and then move to some background and context for the library's bond requests that we're making here this evening. Uh, following me, Ryan will provide an overview of the financial projections and bond repayment, and Jacob can answer any legal or procedural questions. And, and certainly anywhere along um, our, in our conversation, Gary Greer and I are also happy to answer any questions throughout this, this discussion. So I'm gonna look back a bit. Um, the library completed a strategic planning process in 2020, even during the pandemic. Uh, we worked with the senior research director at IU, uh, the Center for Survey Research, and they helped us to create a survey, which we mailed to all residents of Monroe County. And we also made it available online. Um, following that data collection, uh, we talked to uh, many additional stakeholders and community partners to to really get a good idea about what the community's expectations for services for the library were. Uh, we got some very clear direction and we also got a lot of excitement and eagerness for the construction of a new Southwest branch. So prompted by this feedback, uh, the library updated our mission, the vision, values, and the goals. And then we 
we have begun on action items to meet those goals in 2021. Throughout the pandemic, and I would say even to today, uh, the library has adapted and pivoted and reached the public in a lot of new ways, as most places have. But we adopted new technology to communicate with the community, to provide contactless service. We increased access to electronic resources. We issued library cards via telephone and online so that folks could access the electronic resources in their homes. We created virtual programs, and there were many other ways that we met the needs of Monroe County residents. But we also sought two grants, and both of those were to support access to digital resources in Monroe County <clears throat> and to bridge the digital divide for our residents. Um, with those grants, the library purchased circulating Wi Fi hotspots, um, circulating iPads, and those have been made available to patrons to borrow. The devices are preloaded with e-library resources, which might be e-books, audio books, music, movie downloading and streaming. But they also allow borrowers to install and use software that they have for their own individual needs. So uh, we have attempted to, to serve or reach more of the digitally underserved in our community. One other thing that we did very early in the pandemic was to expand our Wi-Fi access in our library parking lots. Uh, we had it there before, but we were actually expanded it so because we found that there were more and more people who were actually bringing their own lawn chairs to our parking lot and sitting and using their wife, their laptops. So I'm proud to say that there's a long list of 2020 achievements that of the library, and I and it's included in your packet if you'd like to review it more. Um, at present, the library is now in the last year of a three-year bond. And this was a $2 million bond, and it's really provided for a lot of infrastructure improvements at the main library where we have renovated the children's area. We um, installed new carpeting and painting and meeting rooms and many other spaces. The bond also uh, supported IT updates, which we have um, a rigid uh, replacement schedule, um, as well as providing so for some larger enham enhancements, um, materials handling system, which sorts books on return. Um, the library is also in the midst of replacing one of our outreach vans, uh, which for homebound services and access to materials for people who simply couldn't make it to the library in any other way will be able to continue. And the bond has supported portions of our branch design effort. Uh, so the Series A bond that we're discussing this, e this evening will continue to support the library's long-term maintenance and IT infrastructure needs uh, that are that are pretty clearly defined in our strategic planning documents um, and extend for many years into the future. Meeting our strategic needs to provide library services to Monroe County includes not only maintaining and sustaining the current excellent resources and facilities that we have, but it also means expanding to serve even more of the community. And that's through the addition of a new branch. When I spoke uh, to this council in 2018, it was following our previous strategic planning process. And at that point in time, the library was just beginning a branch feasibility study. And we completed it in early 2019. And since that time, and really long before that, the library has been carefully planning for continued exceptional financial health and the ability to not only build, but to operate and maintain an additional facility. So overall, um, I just want to share with you that the library's financial objectives are to add a new branch library while maintaining our current tax rate and to continue what we have been doing as an exceptional stewardship of our current facilities. Um, we also will be maintaining our current uh, financial health, which I would describe as excellent. We uh, finished an audit for 20, we finished it in December, 2020. It was for 2019. It was with excellent results. There were no comments whatsoever. Um, we also maintain a million dollar reserve in our rainy day fund and a million dollar reserve in our library improvement reserve fund, LERF. So with that, uh, what our future holds for us is a new, Southwest Branch at 890 West Gordon Pike. It's right next door to Bachelor Middle School. Um, it is a, a planned 21,000 square foot building. It's customized to meet some the specific um, services and 
uh, enhancements that the community identified through those discussions and surveys that we had as we did our branch feasibility study. So it will feature circulating collections, of course, popular materials, but also large meeting rooms, conference rooms, study rooms, uh, special places that will welcome children and teens and adults with activities and learning resources for their ages. Uh, we will have a teaching kitchen, which will serve as an innovative space for free hands-on health and wellness learning and be open to Monroe County residents of all ages. We expect to do a lot of programming there and we've had a, a lot of interest uh, in partnering with a variety of community organizations. And in this case, the equipment for the teaching kitchen is made possible um, through a grant uh, from the community foundation. For the branch overall, our current estimated cost for the entire project, which includes designing it, constructing it, equipping it um, to open the branch is just over $12 million. The library will have an estimated six and a half million dollars in savings. And that's while we retain our reserve in rainy day and LERF. Uh, so that is the, um, the reason for the request of bond funding of $6 million for this project. And just overall, I just want to assure you that we have planned very carefully uh, to make sure that we can meet operational costs of a new branch after it's built. Our operating expenses have been estimated based on a, a, a lot of factors, um, really to achieve what we, what we think will be a, a realistic future scenario both for our services, but also we've been controlling costs through the design um, of the facility itself. And some of those specifics are outlined in your package. Uh, but to summarize, um, our anticipated operational costs for the new branch will be covered by what we currently have as current annual operating surplus. In recent years, that surplus has allowed us to accumulate the savings, which we are going to invest in the new branch. And following construction, those savings will be invested in our operating expenses instead. So in uh, your packet, you can see a chart of the actual and estimated surplus in the last few years and what we anticipate in, pre in uh, future years. So beginning in 2022, um, if, if we are fortunate, uh, we hope to, to break ground later in 2021. And in 2022, we will uh, be hiring, uh, beginning to hire staff and hopefully opening at the end of the year. Um, and so we will have some expenses for a new branch, but we anticipate that our surplus, um, even with the new operating expenses will still exist. And that surplus of about uh, $700,000 will provide a safeguard against any unexpected expenses that we might encounter as we bring up a new branch um, or find with our operations. But it also gives us some um, additional assurance or insurance, if you want to call it that, um, to make sure that we can meet our, our financial obligations of any sort, including uh, any reduction to our tax revenue um, that could be caused by annexation. So I'm happy to answer any questions before turning this over to Ryan for further details. I think, yeah, I think that's, uh, that would be good. Let's check at this point. And thank you for the very thorough, comprehensive uh, presentation there. That was uh, extraordinarily helpful uh, to this process. Let's see if there's any uh, council members that have any questions or remarks at this point, and then we can kind of reconvene on uh, uh, further aspects of the presentation. Ms. Hawk and then Mr. McKim. Uh, yes, first of all, uh, this has been a long time coming. Doesn't seem that long ago. I mean, I was meeting with the young scouts and talking to them about the possibility of a new library. Right. Oh, they just wanted it right up the hill from their school and they were uh -huh. so excited. So, uh, but as you know, from the very beginning, my question has not been, what does it cost to build the building? But making sure that we've covered operational costs because we don't want to do something that will sink the ship that because we're successful now and we want to stay that way. Um, and uh, so I have some financial questions and is this best if I just wait for the next person who's going to present? I, because it looked to me like it was cutting it fairly short even if we didn't see a loss through annexation. 
And so my question really is, have you had uh, Baker Tilly, I know that they worked with you on this bond issue. Have you asked them or ha have them work with you to let you know what the loss in revenue might be, uh, not just with your property tax because of the circuit breaker, <laughs> but also the loss in the income tax because that's going to change rather, I would think rather dramatically from where we are presently. Uh, so, and whoever wants to answer that question down the road, I'm sure many people have the similar questions about that. Okay, so remind me, the, the Baker Tilly representative is- Brian Fetters. Mr. Fetters, okay. And then Mr. McClellan is the legal counsel? Correct. Okay, got it. Mr. Fetters? So with regard to, we have not done any kind of analysis of the loss of income tax due to what I thought I heard was the annexation. Is that what you, is that what you mm -hmm. were asking? Right. So we have not done anything at this time regarding that itself. Uh, and that, as I understand it, though, is a few years, a couple years down the road before it comes into full implementation. But we have not run that analysis. Uh, and in terms of circuit breaker, what would happen with regard to this debt is really not going to be any more from this project as what it was has been uh, because they're planning to keep the same uh, relative tax rate of one cent or just under. Okay. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we all know that um, circuit breaker is tied to the assessed value, and we have seen that our existing properties not talking about new growth of assessed value from new properties being built, but our existing properties. So something, an article just today that uh, the average price of a home uh, in value, the sales price was going up something like 30 some percent mm -hmm. in the last study. Was that? Might have been through my real estate uh, news that I received today. Uh, so we know if you if the plan is a couple of things. If the plan is to keep the same tax rate against the individual taxpayer, but their assessed value goes way up, then that really means we're raising their taxes. So is is there any plan to reduce the tax rate if you see a higher overall assessed value? That's one question. And the other question is if if it does uh, increase that uh, assessed value a great deal, uh, then there's gonna be more people hit that circuit breaker. Well, I'm happy to talk about that. And I don't know the specifics about annexation, uh, but I can talk to circuit breaker in, in broad terms. Okay. So circuit breaker is really, it is related to assessed valuation and it's driven by the tax rate. So as the tax rate increases, okay, more folks are pushed up towards the tax caps, okay? And as the tax rate decreases, fewer people are at, would be at, maybe at the tax caps or the credits that are being generated by those folks at the tax caps would be less. So what I heard you asking was with the value of homes going up and, and possibly increasing the assessed valuation, that's really from one perspective could be a good thing because the whole tax base is going up, which means that while the assessed value is going up, there's an inverse relationship. So the tax rate would actually be falling and it would be lowering the circuit breaker impacts most likely. Now I'm talking in broad terms. I don't know the exact situation of what, what, what you were uh, talking about, but we're talking about just in general conversation. So let me clarify too what the plan is for the debt. The debt is anticipated to be a level structure. And so we're including in our analysis a 3%, I believe it's, I have to look at the notes here in the, in the presentation, but it's roughly a 3% each year uh, increase in net assessed value, I wanna say through 2026, and then we flatline it. So when I say it's a level structure, each year that those home values are increasing, the debt's not increasing. The debt is staying the same. The debt service is staying the same. So in theory, if um, the county were to see the kind of growth that we're anticipating and 3% annually, I would say is conservative uh, with what we've been seeing there, then that means that each year the debt service, and as you'll see in the presentation, if I go through it, the tax rate, excuse me, is going to decrease okay, over time. 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. That was my question. Yeah. yeah. So we're not, we are not increasing the debt service in a stair step uh, so that it is, uh, so that it's going to be a higher level of debt service even and keep, we're not managing the tax rate. We're managing in terms of keeping the tax rate in pace with the one cent. We're, we're managing the debt service or the tax levy. So what we would anticipate happening is the tax rate would decrease in future years, given the same level, I believe that the target rate is $900,000 of annual debt service. And so I'm happy to go through that report. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. That was exactly my question. Thanks. Okay, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, yes, Mr. Iverson. I don't know. Am I calling people? Uh, I'm not sure. I think Sorry. Mr. McKim, Mr. McKim was next. Pardon me. Um, yeah, actually, I, I kind of did want to get back to the, <clears throat> the annexation question and possible reduction in revenue. So just to make it a little bit more concrete, you know, the city did their analysis and for better or worse, they estimated that, you know, the impact on the library would be about 180,000 uh, based on, you know, mo mostly mo the majority of it being income tax, but also circuit increased circuit breaker and, uh, uh, and then excise tax. And, you know, of course, we've already heard how possibly the circuit breaker could be mitigated if property values keep, keep going up. But regardless of that, just taking that 180,000, let's call it 200,000, let's say it's an underestimate and it's really a $200,000 estimate. How does the uh, impact, how does that affect your ability to right. operate existing and new branch? It, it will um, obviously impact us because it's a, a big chunk of change, but we anticipate continued surplus operating uh, funds and even beyond the new operational costs that we will have in the branch. So we will be paying our bills with the new operations expenses and still have surplus in our operating budget, which will be there it, as insurance for any of those reductions in revenue. So we'll just have less savings to transfer. We'll have less savings. That's correct. That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Iverson. That, I was going to ask a very similar question about uh, surplus, the impact on surplus. But uh, uh, Mr. Fetters, I also wanted to point out, I think it's slide seven, which is page 68 of our packet, is the visual representation of what you were just saying. And so for those visual learners out there, that's a very helpful chart. Thank you for including that. You're very welcome. And I'll probably uh, ask more questions in a little bit here. Okay. Mr. Decker. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess to, to restate a question, to make sure I'm hearing this is clear and I've been through the, the documents to get this, Marilyn and Ryan, what you're essentially saying is that it's those surplus dollars that you've had over the years that have brought you halfway to this project. And you mm -hmm. believe that it's that management and those future surplus dollars that will continue to protect the library on operating expenses down the road should scenario A, B, C start to happen under that $200,000 um, estimate at least. You are correct that we are at a level right now mm -hmm. where our surplus actually exceeds what new operating costs will be. So we will continue to have some more uh, surplus and it might just be reduced should we find ourselves with less revenue. Thank you. I'll probably have more questions, but I appreciate that very much. Okay. Any other questions or comments at this point? Ms. Hawk? Yes. Um, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm just going by what I'm trying hopefully remembered. Your your total operating you had estimated to be, was that around seven hundred thousand? Yeah, it was right around six seventy-five, I believe, is what we okay. were estimating. Mm -hmm. And and you were uh, anticipating that you would be able to get uh, like the difference, you would still have to put in surplus uh, with paying this, covering this would be another, there was a $300,000 uh, mentioned in there, 300 and some thousand dollars. And so it seems to me uh, that if we're thinking what one hundred eighty thousand you might lose with the with the annexation? That to me seems like we're cutting it pretty close. So I'm saying if it gets to there, I just hope that you have plan A, B, and C in order that you're still going to be able to keep all libraries open and operating. Yeah. I you know I I I want 
every one of them to be successful. It's as we do as well. And I think that that 300,000 is actually related to what our anticipated savings and our anticipated cost for the branch will be right now. Um, the, it's actually $700,000 for operating right. surplus. So we have a little bit more even to play with. And I'll give you, and I'll let you know too, something that we haven't even, that we haven't expressed yet uh, because uh, the friends of the library will get to make this, but I'll tell you first, uh, we have a pledge from them for $695,000. So wow. that will help us. Um, that will go a long way in, in providing a little bit of latitude for us should we find that our bid comes in higher than what we think it might. So of course, we always worry about that. So we've got, so we, so we've got some really good things um, that we can count on right now. Wonderful. Very good. So um, at this point, is there a presentation that Mr. Fetters, that you had that you wanted to kind of go through with there us? There is. Yeah. I, and I'm, do I don't know if I'm able to share that. If you'd like me, I can, or if everyone <laughs> has it and you want me to go through. Let's share it just for the, for, okay. for the public that may be watching. Please. And then we have some media on here as well, too. It may be good for them. Are you able to see the Monroe County Public Library presentation? Yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. So, Again, uh, good evening. I'm Ryan Fetters. I'm with Baker Tilly, and we serve as municipal advisor to the library. And what we have here is just a small presentation to talk about the financing of the uh, projects with bonds. So we're only looking at the bonding side here, uh, the portion that's going to be financed that way. And I have some extra slides here, and I'm going to talk mainly at a 30,000 foot view. Uh, and then Mr. Iverson talked about I think it's slide seven, uh, which is where I'm going to probably spend most of my time talking about uh, the impacts uh, and then certainly will be available for any questions you might have. Let's see. Okay, so what this is slide is the schedule of the library's outstanding indebtedness and they're paying roughly $700,000 a year in debt service. What the goal is, and you can see we're showing 19 through 2021. So they've already paid 19, they've already paid 20. They're probably getting ready to make the first payment here on the 2021 bonds, excuse me, 2021 uh, uh, July debt service. And so they'll have those two payments to make. And then um, what that creates is an opportunity for them to issue uh, these bonds that we're talking about in order to finance these projects. That was a little faster, so I apologize. That's the graphical representation, just to show that it's a level structure like what we've been talking about. This slide that you have in your packet, all this is to show is that the library intends to issue the bonds as general obligation debt. And what this is showing is every unit, including the county. And, and so I just wanna explain as part of the reason we're here, I don't know if we've explained this already, but through the, and if I'm stepping on any, toes from Jacob, I'm sorry. Uh, so what this is, is basically we're here because we need approval from the county council in order to issue the bonds because the library board has uh, an appointed board. And so that's part of the mechanism through which we go through this. And so while I'm showing this general obligation bonding capacity, this is separate and distinct from the county's bonding capacity. So this in no way, shape or form impacts your ability to issue debt, okay, in terms of what your constitutional uh, debt limit is. And this is just for general obligation bonds. And because the library has such a broad, large tax base, um, they have roughly 7.8, almost $7.9 billion of an SS valuation. Uh, when we use the formula to calculate their debt limit, which is dividing by three, taking 2%, you'll see that they have roughly $52.5 million of debt limit. And when we net out the outstanding principal, only the principal on the outstanding debt, uh, they have the ability to issue $51.8 million in general obligation debt. And there's two types of bonds that libraries typically issue. Geo debt, general obligation debt, which is in the direct uh, name of the library. It's more efficient. It's a little cheaper. And it's the way to go when you have that capacity. And so I'm not going to speak about the lease bonds because they don't need to do that. But that's the purpose of the schedule to show that they have more uh, than necessary uh, to issue. And what we're talking about is... Um, $8 million in bonds in total, uh, but they're not anticipating issuing more than that. This is just the capacity and it does not impact the county's debt limit. Every taxing unit that has taxing authority 
uh, and that can levy debt, they have their own geo debt limit. And so this slide here, five, is just a summary of the two issues. And so I, I know we've talked a little bit about uh, the B bonds that I've heard, which is uh, to finance the, the, uh, the new branch that we've been talking about. But there's also a 2021A bond. And so that's to, to help with some of the other operating, not operating, but operational or um, deferred maintenance kind of items that the, the library wishes to spend on some of the other branches. And so what we're looking at here is I've shown you that they have debt that extends until this year, which will mature. The idea would be to issue both of these bonds this year. The tax rate comes on always in the year after the year of issuance. So the tax rate will come on in 2022. And the idea is to layer these two bonds and we'll show, I'll show you this and it'll be a little clearer in the next couple of slides here, uh, to layer these bonds on to not have a, a measure, a, a, a significant impact on the tax rate. And everything we're showing you here tonight is based upon maximums. So we are showing what the maximums are. I'm showing using an interest rate of 5% when I calculate the bonds. But I can tell you in selling bonds, recently we're under two percent so we're just showing you trying to be conservative because that's my job as municipal advisor is to show you what the high end is and we don't think we think that we're going to be somewhere around under two percent um, on each of the bonds when they're finally sold um, so what this is showing is the a bonds which would be a shorter repayment of seven years and so using that five percent again you know we're showing a repayment of $448,000, again, this is very high. I think it would be coming much lower than this. Um, and the annual debt service payment, the maximum would be about $411,000. On the, the B bonds, the series B bonds, that would be a longer bond. So that was really gonna form the base of the debt structure and this debt management scenario. And we're gonna layer on top those A bonds, okay? So uh, we'd have a longer 20 year term the interest would be roughly $3.4 million. Again, that's very high because I'm, we're using 5%. It's going to be, I think, much lower than that. Uh, but that would be repaid in addition to these principal amounts of the $2 million and $6 million respectively over those uh, respective timeframes. Together, what we're looking at is in impact, and I'm showing 2020 and 2021 for good reason, um, 2020, the tax rate, I'm just going to move on to the next page here, be a little more easier to see here. So let me back up a little bit and explain what's going on here. We have the existing debt we've already talked about of roughly $700,000, and that's in 19, 20, and 21. We would be issuing these bonds in 2021, and you can see the debt service, these new colors of debt service bars come on in 2022. We're forming a layer, a base foundation here with the Series B, which is really the new branch of the $6 million. And on top of that, we would be layering the A's, which is roughly $2 million, and it's a shorter term. So these can be a little bit longer if, as we need it, so we have some flexibility to stretch that out. The goal here in keeping this debt service, you'll notice the debt service goes up to $900,000. That is our target debt service because given the growth that you've had in the net assessed valuation where we're using uh, roughly 3%, I'm gonna go back for the exact, if you get in the footnotes here, uh, we're assuming the net assessed value is growing by 3% annually until 2026. So at that point, we're at roughly $9.1 billion and we're holding it flat from 2026 on just to be conservative. So to answer the question that was asked about assessed valuation increasing and what that really means, what you'll see here, and I'm gonna explain this little dip in a second, but the goal here is to stay at roughly, this is 0 0.0096 or just under one cent, which is where the library has been with its debt service tax rate in 19 and 20. And the goal is to maintain that moving forward. But once we set these bonds, the AV will continue to grow and we and the, the the debt service, excuse me, the tax rate will decline, even though the debt service is roughly at that 900 level. And that's because it's the relationship when we calculate the tax rate of we'll have a fixed level debt service. And then as the AV is increasing under our estimation, 
uh, then the tax rate would drop because there's an inverse relationship between the net assessed valuation and the tax rate. So as a product just of budgeting, this year the tax rate dropped a little bit. It dropped down to uh, uh, 0 0.0067. And so that's just because there was no existing debt going on. It's a function of the way the debt, the DLGF's form works. And so the idea is when they issue this, we'll just be back up at the level that we've been and the debt service has stayed the same. But there would be a little bit of a bump increase here, taking advantage of the fact that the AV has increased, but staying at that target tax rate uh, of one cent for a few years until the AV increases more and then you start to see a decline. I just said a lot of information very quickly and so I'm going to uh, wait here and see if I can answer questions because I hope I didn't confuse anyone. Yeah, let's, and thank you very much for, uh, for that information. Let's see if there's any questions for you, Mr. McKim and then Ms. Wilkes. Right, thank you very much. Um, the, uh, in 2022, the B series debt service is quite a bit higher than in subsequent years. What's, I'm just curious what the, what the rationale for oh, that Oh, it's because is. that's an excellent question. So when we have debt service, there is an interest mm -hmm. and a principal component. And so the longer that we stretch out these bonds, and so in this case, it's a longer bond, we end up with more interest in the first payment here. And that's why uh, it's a little bit bigger than the others. So there's a higher interest component here. And it's a function of you, we pay repay bonds or the, the library makes a bond payment every six months. Even though I'm showing one bar for each year, they're actually making payments twice a year. And so what's gonna happen, this payment here is actually gonna be longer than six months because there'll be some time between when we issue the bonds and the July payment. So it's a little bit bigger and that's just why. And because we have a shorter repayment structure here, we were just, we don't, we're not saddled with the same interest expense on this uh, series A. So we just took advantage of that here. At the end, it's the same. I mean, in terms of what you're gonna be paying, but that's why, that's why that occurs. Okay, thanks. And then the other question is, so, you know, from this diagram, it looks like the tax rate's gonna hover around, a, around just under a penny and then plummet when the A series bonds are paid off. I assume that the idea is that at that point, you're going to need another series of bonds just to continue the investment and replacement maintenance right. of, of existing facilities. Is that, is that what you're thinking? Yes, that's our plan. Okay, thanks. Ms. Wilkes. Apologies, I had muted. Um, so part of... One question was just answered, so that's great. The other one was, could you uh, touch back onto the dip for this year? Sure. Um, I was following you and then I think I understood what you said about that. Um, could you just tell me again, please? I'm sorry. Yeah, let me start out with an example first and then maybe that'll help because this gets confusing. My son, he's five years old, he loves Godzilla, okay? And uh, I know this is strange, but bear with me. He loves Godzilla and he wants something called a battle damage Godzilla. And it costs, let's say $20, okay? So he said, hey dad, uh, I need $20. Can I have $20 for this, this, uh, this figure? And I'm trying to be responsible dad. So I said, okay, let's learn the value of money. How much is in your pocket? And he says, well, I have $10. I said, well, you don't really need me to give you $20 then, do you? You really only need $10. And so what I'm saying is, and how this relates, is that this debt, there's a certain amount of, uh, of fund balance that the library is able to keep. And so when they go and they do the budget for 2021, they apply that money that's in there. And this is a so they apply that money and when um, they are budgeting for this, you're actually allowed to budget for um, the, the budget year and for a portion of the next budget year. And so really what I'm getting at is because they, when they did the budget in 2020, we don't have any debt coming on, excuse me, in 2024, 2021, but they don't have any debt on. They said, okay, 
what money do you have in the bank? And we're going to make you apply that and lower the levy because you don't need that extra money because you have no debt in 2021. And that's where that, that little example of how much money you have in your pocket, they make you pay whatever you've got. And so that's why that happened. I see. Got I don't it. know if that was clear, but I hope that explains. It's basically they're forced to spend down what they've got in there. Um, if they had, um, yeah. And so that's really what it is. It's just an artificial spend down that occurred. Got it. You get bonus points for including Godzilla in your answer. So. Fantastic. Especially <laughs> made it better. Especially with Council Member Deckard. Oh, did I? <laughs> I say, yeah. yeah, that's true. All right. Any, who else has a question? There is one more slide that I didn't show because I thought I, I think oh. everyone understands this, but this is where the rubber meets the road. And so I just wanted to show while we are showing an impact here, you know, a slight impact, we wanted to show you what that is, right? And so in um, response to um, uh, member Witz's, Witz's question uh, in terms of, you know, what the dip is, you know, if we look at 2020, if we look at 2020, where we've been, we're talking about a slight increase of in initially, this is all just going to be for 2022. And then future years, it's going to drop, but it's point zero, So seven hundredths of a penny. All right. For in relation to 2020 and where we had the, the dip this year in 2021, we'd be at about a third of a cent increase just for that first year. And technically really, because we have the ability to lengthen this bond, we were just trying to pay it off as quickly as possible. But when we get the interest rates on the day of the sale, we have the ability to restructure the debt. If we needed to, we could, put, we could extend this debt out. But remember, everything I've based here is on 5%. I'm expecting to be well under 2%. And this is just to show you what's the worst case scenario that could happen. And that's why we show this is just to be upfront so you can see that, but we're not anticipating that. So uh, just to continue that thought, if we, you know, we're talking 62 cents on the median home value, what this is, is a um, estimated annual tax impair, excuse me, taxpayer impact slide. And so I'm just showing you what the, inc uh, the increase from 2020 for that one year, if it were to occur, would be versus this year, what it would be and what would be on different home values. And so the median home value within the library district is about $185,000. So we're talking, it would be 62 cents from what they were paying in 2020 versus $3 and 16 cents. If we looked at the tax rate dip that we talked about. So from this year to next year for the median home value, um, and then for farmland, these are the impacts here. We're talking about for 100 acres, 90 cents. And this is in addition to what they're paying now. And to be conservative, I'll say for every year outstanding, but we, we're, we're fairly confident that the, the net assessed valuation, as has been discussed already, is climbing rapidly. Again, we think that your tax rate's going to drop. And then commercial property uh, here would be 70 cents versus $3.60. Again, this is just accounting for this dip, right? But we're planning to keep the tax rate initially right at that one cent where it's been. All right. Any other questions? The council? Uh, any comments before we... Uh... I'm, I think we're getting preparing ourselves for a vote here. So uh, this will be one final opportunity before we do that. Mr. McKim and then Mr. Deckard and then Mr. Iverson. Thank you. So this question is more for Ms. Wood. Um, I mean, I, I want to thank uh, uh, the, um, the presenter for such a professional presentation. I think you definitely set the bar pretty high and I've I'm very glad that we're going to be using Baker Tilly for our, uh, our annexation analysis as well. But uh, that this kind of uh, presentation is exactly, uh, I think, made a lot of things clear. Um, actually, I really wanted to just go back and, first of all, just congratulate the library on how well you have um, kind of adapted your uh, carrying out of your mission throughout, you know, throughout the last decades and some pretty dramatic changes in society, especially over the last year, but even before that to continue to be relevant. I think that's really important. Um, and, but I did want to ask just a little bit more about the um, electronic equipment that you, uh, that, that you're lending out. Cause I think that's a really 
interesting service and uh, it was definitely a good response to the needs of the pandemic did that was that was that grant funded did you just purchase that out of uh, out of your budget and did you ever run short of equipment is that the sort of thing that you need more of or did you have the right quantities or what um, great. Thank you for what you said about uh, the, how the library has adapted over time. Um, so our we have what we are we have called the library of things and it continues to grow. But um, something that we've had for several years now is is Wi-Fi hotspots. And and for years they were perpetually um, uh, at, in the community. We didn't have enough to go around. We had long hold lists. And so that was sort of the where we um, stuck our toe in the water uh, we didn't we didn't have very many other circulating items but with the grants and we received two grants one from the city's digital program and another from the wall family trust and with those two grants we purchased additional hotspots and now every now and then there's one on the shelf um, they're not always in use and we also purchased circulating laptops and we loaded them with electronic resources. So we're, um, we think that we could probably, and this is not new for libraries to have circulating laptops, but we think that's probably an area where we're gonna continue to expand because it's something that the community has a need for. Uh, but we haven't had uh, the sources of, of um, money for that in the past. So we, this grant really helped us, but we're looking at some of the new, um, uh, grant opportunities that are out there, particularly with some of the emergency um, funding that's available. So we may be able to expand upon it fairly rapidly. But the demand is there. You the saw demand people is there. in the community making use of that. Awesome. Thank you. The, the, the Library of Things is in a new space and, and I walk by it every day and there's nothing on the shelf. So it's in use. Okay, so the lineup here is Decker, Iris, and Hawk. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for this extremely thorough presentation. Talk about clarity and, and, and libraries doing what libraries do well, providing information. My gosh, it's on display today. And certainly I, I have a two part question that I, I want to ask you about. First of all, is there anything from the, the, the pandemic period that you are taking into future plans, not only for this branch, but the others that maybe a benefit that you've learned. And I think the second thing is, when I look at the location of this, this branch on a map, I don't think I can ever recall a, a branch that's so situated between so many different neighborhoods, communities, and also drivable at right. the same time. Was that a factor in some of your thoughts as you put this together? I'd love to hear comments on both of these. Absolutely. I'm going to answer your second part first. This was the perfect place for us to put this branch. So, um, where we are on the we're on the trails. We're we're next to growing neighborhoods. Uh, we're right next to a, a junior high school. Uh, we've already um, began began talking with the the principal at Bachelor Middle School to talk about ways that we can partner on a variety of things, anywhere from um, from health and wellness, because there are gonna be walking trails around it, there's a great outdoor area, uh, to biology and sustainability and all the things that could go along with that in this new teaching kitchen. So we have a lot of fun plans ahead for it. Um, so uh, in relationship to um, the what the pandemic taught us, um, yeah, there have been a lot of ways that we've pivoted that we'll probably never go back. Uh, certainly, there are more people that have learned of us from the, I suppose this is probably pretty self, self apparent, but uh, the electronic resources now, people are much more aware of all the ones that we have and making use of them. So some of the things that we heard in the past about, oh, I didn't know you had that. I didn't know I could do it. We were able to get the word out on some of those things in a, in a, in a good way. Um, we're, we're reaching, our, our numbers are not back to where we want them to be, um, as I think most places would say that right now, but we're going to get them back. And, and I feel very confident that when we do, it will be uh, to provide services that people have not only grown to love, but also evolved to love during the pandemic. So I think that virtual programming will stay with us. Um, being out in the community uh, to, to meet people in particularly in outreach areas. Outreach is going to continue to grow. It's not always going to be about coming to the library. It's going to be where those people can't, can't, can't get to the library that we're going to reach them. Um, and, and electronic resources are obviously here to stay for, a, you know, for growth. 
And I'm actually going to ask if, you know, if Greer is on this call, if he wanted to add anything to that, because he's been so instrumental in, in leading our public services front. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. I'm, I'm Greer Carson, the new Associate Director here at MCPL. Uh, just quickly following up on what Marilyn said about electronic resources. Um, if you follow anything in the world of public libraries, you probably know that libraries have kind of struggle with the idea of, of relevance in the 21st century, particularly with regard to the internet. And when the pandemic hit, one of the first things that we kind of sat down and started talking about was, okay, what are the silver linings? And a, and a big potential silver lining is for a lot of our, what we'll call analog users, um, this might be the opportunity to help them figure out how to make better use of our electronic resources. And so the best thing we could do right at the start of the pandemic was to increase access. And the way we did that was to increase funding for our digital resources. So this is things like Overdrive and Hoopla mm -hmm. and Regal and Canopy video services, things like that, um, to, to further and better promote those uh, through our marketing efforts. And then to analyze how much use we're seeing during the pandemic. So probably around June, July and August of 2020, we realized that that spike in use for digital collections, which you would expect if we had to keep our, our physical uh, facilities closed, uh, was pretty consistent. And here we are now in uh, the middle of 2021 and they're still way up. So the silver lining from the pandemic as far as public library service is concerned is very hopefully, and I think likely, that we're gonna see a lot of uh, library users who were before a little reluctant to dive into digital resources like those that I listed, uh, finally realizing this is the way to use a public library. Um, and so we're very excited about that. Again, we, we cautiously use the word, uh, the, the term silver lining when it comes to COVID, but that's something that did happen. And I'm sure a lot of our peer libraries are experiencing the same thing. And we will continue uh, uh, to push that as part of our strategy for serving the public going forward. And the use of um, uh, circulating iPads through the city's digital equity grant that Marilyn referenced, um, and of course the wireless hotspots uh, con in conjunction with those, uh, they fit perfectly with promoting digital resources uh, because we're saying use the library online, think of the library as a, as a digital place, and if you don't have access to the technology to do that, here's the technology as well. So, and I know it's kind of interesting to talk about this in the context of, uh, of, of wanting to build another branch because it seems somewhat antithetical, but we see it as just a, another way of diversifying the way we serve the community because we're always gonna have people who wanna come to our physical locations as well. Thank you very much, both of you. Mr. Iverson? Yeah, uh, I, I'm gonna be supporting this and, and I, I wanted to explain a little bit why. I, I think the first reason I think is, is what um, Mr. Fetters pointed out is that the impact to local taxpayers is very reasonable. And you know, as I as I look at the impact on taxpayers, I think about the different late fees and book replacement costs that uh, my family has accrued over the years. And I'm kind of want you know a wing named after us. We've spent so much in book replacement costs. And but I, I do think that this is reasonable. And and I think it's reasonable for my second reason that I'm supporting this is is that the library is such a great investment in our community. Uh, time and time again, uh, I think the library has shown. Uh, the better version of ourselves in, in our community. And, and if you look at the values of the library, it really does reflect a lot of the things that we're trying to do here in Monroe County. And I know that other institutions are doing too, but they're being a leader in that. And I think that as you look at what's happening in the libraries with accessibility, with, uh, with racial justice, and the, the, the focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, these are all things that I think we can all look toward. And, and I think the, the proof is in the pudding is if you go to the downtown library branch, you see uh, a variety of, of different slices of our society uh, in terms of, of there's, just, uh, there's just a little bit of everything that Bloomington is in the, the public library and the Ellettsville branch is, is, is a lot the same. It's just it's, it's a great place. So I think those are reasons why uh, I'm going to be supporting this. And I think the vast majority of, of Monroe County residents uh, share that view. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Hawk. Uh, yes. I um, just wanted to ask, I, I believe I saw on your uh, information that 
you had not planned a, a drive through. And the reason why I would really uh, would want to encourage you to see if there's a way that you could change that. It would be wonderful because we have a lot of like uh, young mothers who have sleeping children in their car. Maybe they want to drop books off or, or pick something up. Uh, we have elderly that if the weather is such that maybe they're a little concerned to get out and walk, uh, that would, and they count on using that library. I think our senior citizens really appreciate holding a book in their hand and not a laptop uh, or you know some kind of a reader. They love holding that book. Um, and, and we have uh, people who work you know, have to deal with handicaps uh, that might not be as comfortable about getting out and walking in perhaps, you know, rainy weather or something to be able to access their library. So, I mean, not everybody's going to live nearby. Not everybody's going to be able to get on a bike to get there. And I would just like to see that we're going to be able to serve those people as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Munson? I'll just second what um, Councillor Hawk has requested. I think that I think the drive-through uh, pick up and drop off are really an important feature of the downtown library. And I hope it will be possible for, for the Southwest Library. <clears throat> but I want to thank you for the detail financial information that was presented tonight so that we could uh, see very clearly that this is not going to be a major uh, impact on finances for the residents of Monroe County. And it's just having this information put forth to the residents right now, I know they're gonna be very excited about the library. And the planning that has got into this has been so superb, starting with <clears throat> starting with your surveys and your community outreach. I think the community is building this library yes. and that's thanks to your leadership, Ms. Wood. Thank you. Yep, uh, couldn't have said it better myself. I think that, um, uh, and totally agree with what Ms. Munson said. Uh, going back to what Mr. McKim said, totally agree with that. I think this presentation has been fantastic. Lots of, uh, I'm <clears throat> glad uh, Baker Tilly was here to uh, provide a lot of this information. It gives me great comfort in knowing that we're also going to be working with them on some other things too here uh, coming. I think Mr. Uh, Iverson characterized this as a reasonable <clears throat> impact to taxpayers. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit further and say that this <clears throat> is a hell of a deal for taxpayers. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to vote in favor of this. Uh, I get to talk to my constituents pretty frequently in District 4. Uh, right now, it seems like we're kind of concentrated on two topics. Uh, one of those topics is uh, I hear a lot about annexation. I hear a lot of thoughts about that and not, not a whole lot of positive thoughts. But one of the other uh, topics that we talk about is this new branch uh, that's going to be coming to the south end of District 4. Uh, for my constituents in that area and for the whole community at large and uh, a lot of positive thoughts about that. So uh, this is all very good and I'm very excited uh, to be supporting this. But again, I just wanna thank uh, the library, uh, Ms. Wood. I think this is all reflective of your leadership and the library's leadership there. This process has been uh, superb, as Ms. Munson said. Uh, I remember when we had those initial meetings it was a couple, two or three years ago, and we met in there at the library and we talked through all these things and everyone was very engaged uh, in understanding uh, what the desires and the needs were. And so that was wonderful. And I know the community <clears throat> had a lot of input and engagement there. So thank you for all of that. But I think this is about as airtight of a plan as there is. I, you mentioned, uh, I think the term you used was careful planning. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's absolutely, I'm, I'm convinced uh, that, that, that that has uh, happened. I, I witnessed it uh, throughout this process. Uh, the excellent financial health that 
the library has is due to the excellent leadership of the library. So again, thank you for, for everything. And I, I very much look forward to this project uh, moving forward and, uh, and voting in favor of it tonight. Any other questions, comments before we do public comment? Mr. Deckard. I realize I never said this and I wanna be clear and on the record. I am of course gonna vote for this uh, this evening to be clear. And I, I firmly believe, as I said to someone earlier today, libraries change lives. Uh, I can think of a myriad of people that that interaction from across this community is huge. Even for myself, over when I trace my life in this community, those branches and the things that they have done are huge. And, and it really is the original co-work space and so much more. Mm -hmm. And it's a, this is an awesome moment for this community. And I look forward to seeing this, but I will be supporting it. Ms. Wiltz, did I, I, I hope I didn't skip over you. Did you have a question or a comment? I'm sorry. I just, I just thought I'd join in the chorus and, uh, and uh, ex extol the virtues of libraries in our community in general and specifically to uh, Monroe County. Um, I know that it's one of the places that interestingly across the lifespan, you can um, go and reap specific benefits that you cannot find elsewhere, whether you're going in person or interacting uh, virtually. So thank you. Um, it makes it a lot easier, certainly when you have such a great presentation and uh, you know the, the financial numbers are so well laid out for us. So um, excited to vote yes on this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKim. I'm sorry, I just had two quick, I don't want to drag this out all night. I just had a couple quick questions. So first of all, I think that um, was, was the, the county I know did provide some funding to the library out of, uh, from CARES Act. Is that right? Uh, were correct. you able to make, make use of that? How, how were you able to? Absolutely. Use oh, we, county a variety of ways, um, certainly through supplies, um, masks. Uh, we, we install plugs of glass. We actually um, installed a new drive up window that's like a pharmacy style window so that it became a real uh, contactless um, event. Um, so that was probably the largest of them. But it really it was it was wonderful that it was available to us. It, it um, helped us a huge, huge, huge amount. Excellent. Thank you. And then I know that there are can you just describe briefly the changes in the design that were made in response to the concerns about possibly cutting down uh, too many trees from a community urban forest there? I certainly can, and actually, it will it will also answer uh, the question about the drive-in window. Um, so uh, we originally uh, um, the the property when we first started. Um, uh, we anticipated using the, the whole of the property that was from the Bachelor Middle School Drive over and it would face, you know, going east, we had a large um, portion of it. But as soon as we were um, in the midst of, of making those plans was when we learned that the county was going to be installing a second rotary on Gordon Pike. And that was gonna take a very large corner of the property that we were anticipating purchasing. So we had to go back to the, um, to the, the drawing board on that. And so at the time uh, we were just, we were just brainstorming ideas about the way the, 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 the branch would be situated on the property. We, we, did, we were trying to find out how much property we needed. Uh, we thought it was gonna be five acres, we weren't sure. Um, and so the, the very first attempt from the site um, engineers had us sitting on a very large portion of the trees that were in the bachelor forest. Um, we, reoriented the building so that it actually, which is the way it should have been all along, I, I would also say it faces Gordon Pike. Um, and it is as close to Gordon Pike as we can do it based on setbacks. Um, you can't drive around the building. Uh, you can only drive around a portion of, of the building. Um, we also placed parking underneath the building uh, to reduce the surface impact and to reduce the impact on the trees as well. So there were a variety of things that we did to reduce any of the impact on the trees and also just an environmentally overall um, improvements with it. But it does, it does mean that we cannot have a drive up window. 
but we do have it downtown still. And so we're very hopeful that we will continue, people will continue to make use of it. And also to the bookmobile, anybody can return their materials at any bookmobile stop out in the county. So we hope that we provide other mechanisms for people to get their stuff back to us or pick it up. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. Anything further before we do public comment? All right, seeing none, we will see if there's any public comment on this item. And Mr. Shelton, welcome back. Hi, speaking for myself, I have uh, a bunch of comment, but I'll keep it short. I love our library. I have been hanging out in the library since I was, certainly when I was in high school. Uh, this library is wonderful. I'm so glad they're going to have a branch down there. One of the things, and speaking for the chamber, CATS is a treasure for this community. It is so important for being able to maintain transparency of what government is doing. But back to just being me, I love our library. Marilyn, you've done a great job uh, dealing with this craziness. Uh, I've used it less uh, as than I used to when I would just go hang out there between meetings because I stay home and hang out between meetings. But thank you so much. And I certainly encourage you to approve this. I, I think, you know, I'm an aging person. Uh, my wife uh, is, is uh, needs to use a wheelchair most of the time. And uh, getting in into the one downtown is harder. This will be so much uh, better to be easier to park, I'm sure. Uh, it's a great location. So, and I appreciate you guys for analyzing all the, the economic impacts and I appreciate your consultant for this presentation. It was great. And I'm on the redevelopment commission. I'm so looking forward to you guys analyzing the impact on the rest of the county. Uh, so I, I encourage you to approve this and thanks very much. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Mr. Shelton, thank you for your comments. Any further public comment? Uh, Mr. McClellan, Jacob McClellan, welcome. Sorry about that. Hey, I'm, I'm the library's bond council. Our power dropped here in Indianapolis in my building. I wanted to make sure there are no questions on the resolution. I think Marilyn and, and Ryan covered just about anything I would have covered, but I dropped for a little bit and I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Great, thank you. Okay, any further public comment? Seeing none, I think we are now ready for a roll call vote, please. On the motion to approve resolution 2021-24, authorization of the issuance of bonds by the library. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Great. Thank you. Have, uh, have a good evening all. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And up next is item 13. Uh, this is just a reminder. This is uh, kind of a standing item that we have uh, concerning our boards and commissions. We do have a vacancy on the Women's Commission, it's two year term expires uh, January 1st, 2022. If anybody has uh, any interest in that uh, uh, position, uh, please visit our county website and uh, fill out an application. We would love to talk to you. Are there any questions or comments on that? That's the only vacancy that we have at this point, I believe. So we'll continue to follow up on that. Okay, and now we'll move on to item 14. Council, I move to approve the May 11th, 2021 regular session minutes as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the minutes. Are there any changes, modifications, edits to the minutes? Seeing none, do we have any public comment on the minutes? No public comment. We'll have a roll call vote, please. Am I on? Yes. Um, on the motion to approve the regular session, May 11th, 2021 minutes as presented. Councilor Deckard? Yes. 
Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Very good. Okay, and next up is our council comments. Do we have any council members who'd like to make some closing remarks here before we call it a night? Mr. Deckard. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to quickly thank Sheriff Swain. Earlier today, uh, he and, and the Monroe County Sheriff's Department issued some news, some advisory that they'd been alerted that uh, our na national military our armed services would be doing some practice in the Richland and Bean Blossom Township uh, areas this evening. And he alerted certainly the public that he'd been notified on that. Uh, many of us know that there were practice and, and drills going on last night in the more in the Bloomington area. And certainly this kind of notice on this gives the public some things to be aware of as they start hearing things, noticing things. I certainly in that on that side of town heard those things. We want our armed services to get the training they need and the support that they need, but we also want to reassure residents who are putting kids to bed and alarmed by noises. So certainly, thank you, Sheriff Swain, for letting the, the citizens of Monroe County know about that, and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for that uh, important message there, Mr. Deckard. Any other comments from council members? Uh, Ms. Hawk, yes. Yes, it's an exciting weekend. Uh, for those of us who love the Monroe County History Center, uh, this is their big weekend. So folks, it's Friday and Saturday. Uh, that's when you get to go shopping and look at all of their treasures. I always find something I just can't live without. And, uh, you know, I could I could turn this camera around and show you all the things that I the setting everywhere the artworks hanging on the wall the uh, light fixtures hanging on my dining room table uh, oh, nice. the dishes and whatever are in my cabinets you'll find something you love and it's great to support such a great group of uh, the people supporting our history center. And so kudos to them. And did you see the picture of all the ladies lined up that were serving and they were all in their 80s? Yay, raw. So uh, don't let anybody tell you we have to give up because we don't. Thank you. You're here. <clears throat> Very good. Any other uh, comments or remarks before we close? If not, you know, uh, yeah, Ms. Munson. Not all of the ladies are in their 80s, Marty. No, not everyone, but I'm saying in the picture <laughs> that they had in the newspaper, those ladies. It's great. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, I just want to, uh, again, you know, as I look through this agenda tonight, this was a, a big one. And I was, you know, I had set aside about four hours for this meeting, but I just want to thank all of my colleagues and mm -hmm. you know, everybody who participated in this meeting tonight for really doing their homework, um, getting through this um, efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, these the items that we considered tonight, you look through this here and it, it was some pretty significant stuff and, and transformative uh, in many ways for the community, I think. And so it just makes me so proud again. And I, I know I say this from time to time, but I thought this was a great meeting uh, makes me very, very proud to call you all colleagues and uh, just very much appreciate that. So uh, I look forward to uh, uh, our next meeting, which will be our work session on June. What is that? June 20, 22nd. Mm -hmm. And that's when we will convene again uh, at 5.30 p.m. here on Zoom. Uh, and uh, at this time, we'll be adjourned. <laughs>